This episode of UK Low Carb Podcast is sponsored by Deliciously Guilt Free. Enjoy the show. Hey everyone and welcome to UK Low Carb. I'm really honoured to have a series with my good friend Dr Jenna Wynn. Hi everyone, so pleased to be here. Yeah, we're hoping to tempt you all to come along, interest you to come along to the first International Food Addiction Conference on May the 20th in Bristol as part of the the annual PHC Public Health Collaboration uh, Conference. So yeah, we're going to be doing a series on food addiction, sugar addiction. We might have that debate about what to call it and it's going to be great. Excellent. So join in each week where Jen and I will be going through different topics to do with addiction and at the end you get to ask your questions in a live Q&A as well. So without much further ado, let's get on with the show. Okay, everyone, I am so, so honoured to have Dr. Jen Unwin on the show today. Now, um, last March, March 2021, I started doing these small series and I didn't realise how popular they would be. So, so far, I've had uh, the first person on was Graham Phillips. I did a series with Nicola Howard with Katie Kell Daisy. Um, I've had different series of different people. And of course, most recently, Keto Kev. And each time I'm kind of trying to go a bit deeper than just a podcast episode and actually thinking with one of our topics let's really try to drill into it and learn a bit more about it now there are two people who of course really well known in the low carb community in the uk and that is the unwins and i thought it'd be great to work with jen unwin um, because she's got which i think is quite exciting as well a conference coming up i mean how much excitement can you have it's not even christmas um i've got that she's got a conference coming up in may all about addiction and i thought you know what as we talk about this so often on the show it'd be really important for me to learn from this but also i know many of you probably have issues around addiction so welcome to the show uh jen unwin it's great to have you here thanks for having me dan it's my uh, it's my absolute favorite topic (laughs) kind of (laughs) personally but also professionally right now i think it's uh I think it's so important that we understand this. And I think it's the next phase, you know, particularly for those who are who are struggling to kind of, you know, kind of stay the course or have those times when they really go off piste and yeah. struggle to get back. I think understanding, even if you, you know, you don't want to label yourself as a food addict or a sugar addict. I think if we can just all understand this, this concept, the science behind it, how to recognize it. Um, and what to do about it I think it, it for some of us in particular it gives us that that opportunity to really find our mo- our mojo you know our kind yeah. of food freedom if you like as um as I said on the front of the little book that I wrote fork in the road um you know which obviously obviously I recommend to people the the, the profits go to the public health collaboration and most of what we're talking about um here in this short series will will be sort of covered in you know in a little bit more structural way in in that book fork in the road yeah great so before we kick off with um our episode today can just for anyone who might not know about you can you just tell us a bit about your career and and Mm. what kind of doctor you are yeah so i'm a doctor of clinical psychology and that basically means that i way way back in the midst of time got a psychology degree and then i did a a master's in clinical psychology at Manchester. And then I did, I've got a, also a, a doctor of, a, 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 a doc, I'm a doctor of psychology uh, from Hull University. And I've practiced, so as a clinical psychologist, you, you practice with people uh, in the NHS, in my case, and I worked with people who had chronic health conditions, helping them to, um, have the best quality of life they could with whatever that condition was, chronic pain, diabetes, yes, um, lung diseases, um, you know, cancer and these sorts of uh, problems, how, how, how to help yeah. people to sort of have the best life despite these, these struggles. And then about 10 years ago, David, who's a, who's a GP, we got together because um, I sort of discovered low carb and we would talk about it and he could see the application potentially in his primary care practice. And and the rest is history there. I mean, it's amazing what they've achieved at Norwood. They've, you know, there's well over 100, I think it's probably about 120, 130 people now in drug-free diabetes remission on their register, um, as wow. well as lots of other people who've massively improved that that condition and, and other health conditions as well through changing their diet to a, to a low carb one. And then we continued to support those people 
some people from the original <laughs> the original cohort still come to our support meetings um and and are, and are doing really well so yeah that's been that's been really a remarkable uh, project that we've both had really got, got a lot out of working on i bet and and the thing that i kind of want to just highlight is that um, I love the way that Dr. David talks about how he would probably tackle the problem from a medical standpoint of medication and make this change in your diet and then that's it. But actually, he learned a lot from your career in the fact that you said, well, oh, actually, people are human and there's something else going on here, isn't there? There's not just it's mm -hmm. not just the, you know, eat, eat fewer carbs, you'll be healthy. Actually, why is it people can't do that sometimes? Why is it they've got a hang up on a food that they might not really enjoy massively, but they can't stop eating? And that's exactly yeah. what this topic's all about, because I think that does affect so many of us. And it is a problem for so many. And I think mm -hmm. this is where we need help sometimes. You know, you can you can read the blogs and say, you know, keto is X, Y, Z. But a year later, you might not be doing keto still. And I think that's the question is, why, why? is it why that is you've it got so a hang up? Why yeah. is it so hard? And, and you know, really, it becomes a lot easier to understand when we sort of pick up this addiction piece, because it's a bit like telling people that smoking's bad for them. And we all know smoking's bad for us. Um, but for some people, they know that they want to stop an incredible struggle because we all know that yeah. nicotine is addictive, exactly the same with alcohol. And so when you look at the behaviours and, and the struggles, um this it's just such a sort of parallel if you like that we know we all know we shouldn't eat sugar in excess like who doesn't know that yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that's not controversial a statement is it everyone everyone's aware of it yeah exactly exactly um, you know not to overeat we shouldn't overeat junk food and so on and yet you know yeah. some of us have had and and some continue to have significant struggles even though they know that to, to change their behavior and we're all intelligent people we've um achieved other things in our lives you know like i've just told you my academic achievements so it, it was kind of embarrassing that i couldn't um as a psychologist even work out what to do about my eating behavior and so the knowledge that we're going to talk about is that that missing piece. And once you've got this knowledge and you can understand why we're driven to do these things, I think that information gives us the power to make some different choices and um, do all the things that we need to do to, 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 to keep going. Often people do really well at the beginning, don't they? They go, we're, we're, we're often the kind of people who've done every diet under the sun. So we know exactly how to follow a regime, right? I'm starting on Monday, yeah. I'm doing, I'm packing my lunch, I'm doing this, that and the other. And we do really well till Christmas. And then yeah. it all goes to pot. And then we think, oh, well, that, that scheme didn't work either. But it's not, yeah. that, it's not that low carb didn't work. As you say, we all feel better. You know, it helps with all these various ailments. Um, it, 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 it does work. It's just that it's how do we stick to it long term? And that's the challenge with our patients as well, because we all live in the real world, don't we? And we're being tempted everywhere we go. And so what can we, David and I, do for the patients at Norwood to help them understand and to support them to stay the course long term and have those health benefits and those psychological benefits long term? Yeah, love that. So let's dive in then. And I really want to know, I mean, I'm, I'm going to ask the, the questions, which I'm sure might seem pretty basic, but I still think it's important because I don't actually think I know the answers to them. And that is, you know, what is an addiction and, and how can you see that in yourself? And and actually quite often it's people around us as well, isn't it? What, what we're looking for to know what an addiction is and where we can identify it. Yeah. And how people's behavior can kind of make sense when, when we see it in these terms. So, right. So as you probably know, there isn't an official diagnosis of food or sugar addiction yet <laughs> yeah. i think time will come and i think uh, that's one big hope for me that in my lifetime that will be a recognized condition obviously other addictions are recognized and um you know it's not so long ago that gambling was recognized as uh, as an addiction so there's 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 two um uh sort of classifications for these kinds of problems one is the icd the international classification of diseases and that's um hosted by the world health organization and we tend to use that in europe right in america there's the dsm which is the diagnostic and statistical manual uh for mental health problems and that's hosted by the american psychiatric association so 
because we're in Europe, let's go with the let's go with the ICD and let's look at the six criteria that they would use for diagnosing someone with substance, a substance use disorder. And of course, within that, they would say alcohol, drugs, um, et cetera. Those are the, the ones that are, that are recognized as the substances that are recognized as addictive. OK, so um, Heidi Yeaver and I that I work with, she's a nutritionist in the UK. And when I run groups and we do weekend retreats and things, we 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 work together as a, a as a team. Um, we've come up with a, an, a, an, an a acronym um, to help us remember these these six symptoms and we've called it craved. So that's mm -hmm. that's how to help us remember. Right. And I'll go through each one. So the first one, C, is for compulsion. And so the criteria there is um, have have you ever um, had an urge or, or compulsion or craving so strong for certain foods that you found it, it kind of impossible to resist? That even though, even though you didn't want to eat whatever it was, eventually the craving was so strong that you went back to the fridge or the freezer or the cupboard or whatever. Um, but yes. <laughs> yeah, I had that for sure. Yeah, yeah. I had yeah. that. Yeah, and so it's uh, also uh, for the listeners as well, keep keep track. So there's the six, but see how many you, you would say yes to. And then yeah. you can think, is that currently a problem for me? Or has that, was that a problem in the past? And it, it's not a problem now. Um, yeah. And if it, if it is and was a problem, when did it start in my life? And when did it finish? And we often find that, particularly with this craving one, well, all the symptoms really, for those of us who have this problem, it's very young, actually, probably for, for always i mean most people i speak to kind of say well five, five or you know before i can't remember a time like i can't remember a time when i didn't have want more of of carbohydrate foods at home and would would be trying to sort of sneak another slice of something or nip into the biscuit jar and you know you kind of know it's wrong you know mom's not approving of you doing that but you want to do it anyway so i'm exactly the same as you jen like yeah i can't remember a time when i haven't craved like those foods and um yeah. you know I, m my grandmother i remember her saying you know oh he eats too much and i was like trying to get extra like carby bits yeah. on my plate and it's it's kind yes. of a bit it's a bit embarrassing to say that out loud because it so, i think this is the difference true. and it's so it, typical yeah. Really typical that we and my mom used to say my eyes were bigger than my stomach. They yeah, weren't actually yeah. my stomach was pretty big as well. I I would put loads oh. on my plate. Like you, you know, I really did did as you say, I can't remember a time when that wasn't the case. And yeah, and yeah, this thing in the family that oh, they're the ones that that eat a lot. I've actually got a granddaughter and uh of the of the four grandchildren, there's 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 one who I so identify with because she's her little eyes light up and she she's always, you know, looking what everyone's got and she wants more. And I think, oh, you know, that's it's not her fault at all. Some of us are yeah. just born that way. <laughs> well, I was just gonna say that's exactly the th the point that I think I, you know, really want to highlight is that it's not your fault, it's just the way you are. And you know, some people don't have that craving and really I'm very happy and and it's lucky for them. They don't. But if you do mm. have it, it you know, it's nothing you can do to stop it being there. You might be able to manage it, which is good, yeah. but you can't stop having it. And and it's not a moral reflection on you as a person. I think that's really important because a lot of people, including myself, have had that before. And it's yeah. it's pretty horrible. It's quite mean and it's yeah. quite cruel to people to do that. I think it's absolutely key what you're saying. And that's cause so at the heart of when we're working with people to get them to understand that it is absolutely not not your fault you were sort of wired this way and there's probably yeah. evolutionary benefits to that actually you and i would have been the survivors down in fact our ancestors yeah. were the survivors so there's that's why we're of, here that's why we're here exactly we're here. there's yeah. benefits to having this this brain but in our society <laughs> it's, a, it's a double whammy because there's all these crazy foods everywhere that we're really drawn to and also there's this kind of um you know kind of fat shaming thing that goes on and one of it's not inevitable you know not everybody who has a food addiction has a weight yeah. problem for sure I mean look at Heidi <laughs> who I work with she was she was never overweight so but she still had a, a sugar addiction problem um and we then we get the 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 the, the, the sort of internalized 
shame of yeah of not being able to stop overeating of being overweight no, nobody want nobody chooses to be overweight or wants yeah. to be overweight and often as teen you know for me as a teenager that was a significant kind of uh yeah it was a it's a challenge really on you you have to sort and, of learn and can i just say it. as well i've heard so many times on this show people who have had amazing transformations and i mean really incredible but actually the challenge is then after they've hit their goal uh, maintaining it and I, and I think this is where you've got to work on this stuff because you know you, you can just do your macros and everything's working really well for you but if you don't work on the fact that you might have to still manage the way that you have these compulsions then actually you can very quickly find that you're back to where you started yeah. again and that's that's really you bad for your health isn't it if you don't recognize that and that was me I had a, 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 a from from when I first started dieting in my early teenage because my mom was definitely looking back at food at it and we both used to go on these crazy diets like egg and grapefruit some people yeah. will remember these crazy things and that set up a pattern and that's very typical as well for a lot of us this yo-yo dieting as you say exactly until we accept that it's not the di you do the diet and then you're cured no it's a lifelong condition you know we, we need to find a a, a lifestyle and a, and a regime that that you know that we can sustain lifelong <laughs> but that's yeah. a bit scary for people so we'll come on to that probably in, in future episodes but so so c uh, c is for compulsion you know yeah. feeling drawn to these foods and not being able to resist that compulsion and then um r we've called reaching for more and that's the idea the sort of um the sort of tolerance idea if you like that people will recognize with alcohol. So when we drink alcohol, the more the more we drink, the more we need to get the same effect. Or, you know, you can get used to drinking quite a lot if you build up your tolerance. So it's a little bit the same with sugar and carbohydrate that you get. And we'll talk about this um, in the next episode as to, to, to why it gives us a kind of these good feelings when we when we first eat these. When we eat these foods, we get you know, these boosts in the neurotransmitters, uh, we feel good. But the next time, because of the way the brain works, we don't get that same, exactly that same result. So we need to have more. So what ends up is where, you know, a couple of biscuits would have done it back in the day, we end up eating the whole packet to get the same effect, or we end up eating the whole cake. So that's this idea of tolerance and needing more and more. Um then A, so we're going through crave. So A is number three, and this is activities neglected. So the other thing that, that happens, and again, it's to do with the brain and dopamine mostly, is we start to focus in on using the substance to, to feel good. And that inevitably crowds out other things that we might have done to feel good so we focus 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 on the food and get obsessed with the food and people will recognize this food thoughts what when you wake up in the morning what am i going to eat today when am i going to eat when, what am i not going to eat what am i gonna... and all this food chatter all the time and an, an inability or a sort of you know a lack of motivation for doing other other things hobbies exercise being with the family you know often we kind of want to withdraw and use our have our drug foods and not have anyone else involved, you know. So we we start to withdraw from life and people rec will recognise that as well, this kind of being, just being in the food and not that feeling of being kind of not really connected to to proper life. So that's, yeah. that's eight that activities. And actually, begin. you know what, I think you can identify that in other things like narcotics and alcoholism, can't you? But it's funny yes. how we probably, because people aren't aware of food addiction, they just don't spot it in the same way. But I think I can see that in people uh, sometimes. And I think, yeah, you're yeah. completely obsessed with your addiction right now. And I think food does that for many of us. Yeah. And that, and that I remember when I was in the food, I never wanted to exercise or yeah. socialize. I kind of felt bad. You feel bad, you know, mushy, kind of foggy brain, a bit depressed. You just want to kind of curl up with your whatever it is. Yeah, yeah I totally agree. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so V, we're on to V and V is for volume. And um, this is this is um, 
eating more and more of those just eating more and more of those yeah. foods and wanting kind of you know cra crazy amounts really um yeah so v is for v is for volume and that increasing over time um e um <laughs> we had to sort of twist this one slightly to find an e that would fit in but e is for an for exclusion and this is about withdrawal symptoms so and again people will recognize this from from other substances if you've ever tried to give up smoking or caffeine or anything obviously you get those physiological and psychological withdrawal symptoms and so what we're proposing and i would say you know again we've all experienced it is when we're coming down off the sugar high we get certain psychological and, and physical problems so typical things are things like sh shakiness obviously you know feeling in incredibly hungry when you're not really hungry um sometimes um dizziness headaches um grumpiness um you know do you remember that hangry thing like david said i used to uh, i did used to get all, all the time you know a couple of hours after eating i'd be kind of ravenous or if a meal was delayed i'd be agitated and kind of furious why can't where's my dinner you know you're waiting at a restaurant and you can't think of anything else apart from when is the waiter going to turn up with this this darn plate of food that yeah you're, yeah you know, and, it's, and it's totally irrational that's the thing isn't it like you just said there, it completely fills your thoughts and you can't justify your behavior or why you're feeling this way you just feel it and and you yeah. kind of it takes over completely agree yeah. You feel like yeah. you're literally starving to death and obviously when we're, we're not because you know usually at that point uh oh, we're we're kind of you know well can i tell you something that's ridiculous jen when i did those you know like long fasts and we've got one uh coming up at the moment just i know it'll probably be um post or, or you know sorry pre this recording uh but it'll be post when it comes out um and on those fasts i can go for let's say 24 hours 48 hours sometimes yeah. i've done like five days fasting don't feel hungry at all absolutely fine other days i'm like i've had lunch maybe i've had breakfast and i'm like oh i'm really hungry i need a meal i'm starving hungry oh. and it's like no i'm not no i'm not it's just it's just my attitude and the way that i'm the messages you know and i'm talking about eating low carb food so there's no there's no like yeah. insulin type response with ghrelin and all the rest of it that's gonna make me hungry it's not that it's the psychology of i really want food and this is how you justify it by saying you're hungry and you can tell yourself that narrative but it's not yeah. it's, it's actually coming down to that of almost what? obsession with I need more this thing more. right now. I need, yeah. I need it. I need it right now, and something terrible is going to happen. Yes, yeah. and we'll talk yeah, about when we when we come to episodes three and four, which are about the food and about recovery. Let's talk about fasting because it's a bit of a complicated one <clears throat> for people yeah. with food oh, addiction. So let's make a note. A lot to talk about on that one. Yeah, for me as well, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we're at the end now. Craved, and I think the the D, the final D is for me, the ultimate defining one, and we touched on it at the beginning, and that's uh, for, for damage. So despite awareness that this substance is causing you physical and mental harm, you continue to do it. So ex that's yeah. exactly what we were saying with the smoking. So despite the fact that I know I feel shocking psychologically when I do this, and, you know, it's Obviously, we all know sugar's bad for us. It's it, it it's a poison. It's going to damage our brains, our circulatory system, our teeth, our you know just it just we all we all know that some of us have type two diabetes or high blood pressure or any of those conditions that are made worse by eating a high carbohydrate diet, and yet <laughs> we that isn't enough to stop us. So D is continued use despite damage, and those are the six criteria for any substance use so you could go through those for alcohol uh, exactly the same but i hope people can see how incredibly well it applies to those of us with this struggle it just describes it completely we can we have a compulsion to eat it uh we need more to get the same effect we we focus on the on the food increasingly at the expense of other important areas in our life we have more and more we when we try and stop we feel grim and that's why we partly go back to it and we continue it despite our logical despite logically knowing we want to stop and there wow. it is that's amazing thank you that's that's a superb kind of um 
yeah, like th that's a great system. I'm going to actually go through that myself and reflect on those things. Although yeah. I must admit, there's a lot of ticks there for me already. Um, yeah. So this is really, really, yeah. it's really helpful. You know what? When you understand yourself and you uh, and you understand with something like this how you work. It's really empowering, isn't it? It really helps you to realize, oh, hang on a minute, it's an addiction. Now it's an addiction. I can work out how it's yeah. working in my life and then what I can do about it. And that's and it, exactly and it, what we'll talk about in future episodes, isn't it? And how many things it explains. Yes, absolutely. That's 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 what we're gonna be talking about. So everybody add up the add up your own score, be very honest with yourself. Three or more would indicate some kind of a. I'm not. We're not going to say that's a diagnosis because a there isn't yeah. a diagnosis, and b obviously it's just a quick screen. But it would indicate there's some issue there, and you definitely want to listen to the the rest of these um, episodes, <coughs> as Dan says, to to work out what to do next. Love it. So, um, what what are we talking about next episode then, Jen? What's <laughs> coming up next week? Okay, so um, next week we're going to talk about why and what how <laughs> how can food be addictive how can sugar be addictive what's actually going on in your brain and this is part of freeing yourself of understanding it's not your fault your brain's been hijacked by these foods and then you can sort of see what what to do about that and then obviously then the following episode we'll go on and talk about the food and specifically tailored for for people with food addictions because there are some different bits of advice compared to standard keto or or low carb yeah and then then the last episode will all be about what else because it's a lot of other stuff other than the food that that as food addicts we need to um think about as well you know every day really um just like someone else with any other kind of ad addictive problem and just to say people you know in you're not alone I think a lot of us felt isolated like you said Dan kind of ashamed kind of why can't I sort this out myself we don't tend to talk about it it's not a recognized condition but I um your people the listeners will perhaps be amazed to know that if we take the most conservative prevalence estimate based on research using the um Yale food addiction scale looking at how many people this affects um the most conservative estimate is probably eight percent uh, of adults and that's 4.3 million of us in the uk wow, so that's a huge plenty number of people, plenty of people at the conference and it's causing a, a massive amount of damage psychologically and and physically and horrifically we know that for every adult there's probably now going to be two children because the really the, wow the food environment has worsened so much uh, and the way young people's nutrition looks, um, it, it, it's a it's a bit of a disaster area for for our youth and for their you know their brains are developing and you'll see next time the effect it has on the the human brain and um, so even if this doesn't apply to you, I hope people will will listen and and take note um, in terms of how they're talking to their children about food and uh, the effect it. It has on their brains and behavior bloom and neck jen okay well there you go everyone so come back next week uh, on uk low carb and we'll be talking more about food addiction just for today though i just want to say a massive thank you to you for your time jen and i really hope for the listeners it can help some of you just to understand yourselves a bit more as well